Hello, my dears, and welcome to another episode of Sydney Gaslight to themselves into liking a specific intellectual property due to what can only be described as sunk cost fallacy and sunk cost fallacy alone. I am your host, and for some reason, I like The Great Gatsby now. Actually, no, not for some reason, because I spent four days straight consuming ten different Gatsby adaptations and then researched six more afterwards and my brain coped by telling me that I was having a good time. Um, this seems like a great segue into who I am and how we got here in the first place. Um, hi, I am Sydney. My pronouns are they them. I am an openly queer, disabled, autistic, trans, non-binary, composer, educator, disability, advocate, media analyst. I make videos about that kind of stuff. You're welcome to stick around if you want. Um, I've sold this video really poorly thus far, but you're definitely welcome to stick around. Also, I'm a white person with light brown, chest length, curly hair, wearing a, uh, like, caramel, nah, more like dark mocha colored dress. Um, and I'm sitting in front of a plain wall that has green leaves on it. And today, we're going to be talking about the nature of adaptation, i.e. what different things do we get from telling a story via different mediums of storytelling, and if we can figure that out, how does that affect how things are adapted? In the theater industry, I hear a lot of like the, why does this need to be a musical discussion? And I want to expand that to, why does anything need to be anything? And how can we best make use of the medium we choose for a specific intellectual property and be conscious about which media we choose when we want to adapt? And intellectual property, which is where Gatsby comes in. I was trying to find something that started as a book and then had a bunch of film adaptations as well as both a play and a musical adaptation in order to make this video. I put a question box in my story months ago asking for ideas. Most of them you gave me were Shakespeare, but I already did that for my Richard III video and then I did the dramaturgy Shakespeare video and I don't like Shakespeare so I refuse to do that again. The second most common one was Pride and Prejudice, but I'm working on a video about autism and Jane Austen already. And the third most recommended one was Little Woman, which is a very long book. Um, and then most of the rest of the ones that you gave me were things that either had musicals but not plays or often not films either, so I was at a loss on what I would do. I was thinking of just rereading all of Little Woman, which would have taken forever. But then in the mail, I got the the promotional materials for the Paper Mill Playhouse as Great Gatsby musical with Jeremy Jordan and Eva Noblezada, and I realized, you know, this book's only 200 pages long, and I want to see the two of them, so that's the one that I chose. I bought my ticket, I bought my copy of the book, I was ready to go. Now, the thing is that my ticket was for November 1st, and I did that thing where I thought November was far away, until all of a sudden it, w it was practically November, and I needed to finish all my research before seeing the show, so I knew what to, like, pay attention to in the show, and it made a very wide wild couple days of consuming every single Gatsby I could possibly get my hands on. So today we're going to be looking at the original book, a graphic novel adaptation, four film adaptations, two plays, one of which I read, one of which I watched, two radio plays, the immersive show, a couple other adaptations I found online like operas and ballets that I don't have a lot about them but I'm bringing them in here anyway, and then the musical that was at the Paper Mill Playhouse from October to November 12th of this year. I know that there is a Rachel Chavkin Florence Welch musical adaptation coming to ART this spring. ART is really far away so I decided to make this video now and if for some odd reason I do end up seeing that adaptation, maybe I'll make a follow-up video. Maybe I won't. Also, if you're wondering why there's so many Gatsby shows happening right now, it entered the public domain at the beginning of 2021, and it takes a long time for adaptations to make it to stage or screen, which is why we're seeing them now. And I'm honestly not opposed to this. I learned a lot through this, and I honestly thought about making it a series with other adaptations, but um, I'm not doing this to myself again, so no. But anyway, the plan is to go through the plot of the thing, and then go through each adaptation in chronological order, and what specific things I noticed in each one, and then at the end we will discuss what I learned from them all collectively in regards to the story, what my ideal adaptation of Gatsby would be, and what I learned about adaptation in general. Also I should mention, it is generally agreed upon that no adaptations of this IP are ever good enough and ever correct, and they are all universally both loved and hated, and countless articles I read while trying to simply track down what adaptations existed of this IP said that the work is effectively unadaptable based on the nature of how the book is structured and perceived by society, and therefore every single adaptation is going to on some level be a flop and there's nothing we can do about it other than maybe we should stop trying to adapt it. Now had I found that information before I bought my ticket, I may have decided against doing this, but you know what? We're here and I'm dragging you along with me. So, plot. Spoilers. Obviously. Also content warnings for adultery, marital abuse, murder, and a lot of misogyny. 
I think that's it. Anyway, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. He was a guy, but we're not gonna get into that. Was published in 1925. It is an odd little book full of random little moments and non sequiturs that all honestly hold more meaning than the major plot does. So if you cut specific little weird side moments when adapting it, you can accidentally miss huge parts of the significance of pieces of the text. But then certain people feel like certain ones are important and others should be cut and nobody agrees on which one and it's really odd. The whole experience is odd. There's no other way to describe it. So anyway, the book takes place in 1922 during the prohibition Prohibition. If you're not from the US, that's when alcohol was illegal for a bit and it backfired so hard. It is narrated by Nick Carraway, a Yale graduate and World War I veteran who just moved to New York City to sell bonds. He rents a little house in West Egg on Long Island, right across the sound from East Egg. East Egg being where all the rich people with the old money live, and West Egg being where all the people with the new money live. And his house is next door to a giant fancy estate owned by Jay Gatsby, an enigmatic dude who throws really large parties. We'll get to him. Nick goes to dinner at his cousin Daisy Buchanan's house over on East Egg. Also her husband Tom is a racist prick who thinks he's smart but really isn't. And also her best friend Jordan Baker who is a golf champion and oozes serious lesbian energy. They recently moved there from Chicago because Tom ended up in a car accident that ended up in the papers there and a chambermaid was in the car with him at the time and they were almost definitely having an affair. We learned that later in the book somewhere, not early but that so the subtext, whatever. Anyway, during dinner, the phone rings and Tom goes off to answer it with Daisy following to yell at him because everybody knows the person on the phone is totally his mistress. And that night, Nick sees Gatsby standing out on his lawn, staring across the sound at the other egg and the green light that is shining from the other egg. A few days later, Tom takes Nick into the city, stopping by George Wilson's garage in the Valley of Ashes along the way, where he makes small talk with George, and then when George is in the other room, tells his wife Myrtle to get on the next train to the city. Tom has an apartment in the Washington Heights Harlem area where he and Myrtle regularly meet up and have their little affair with each other, so they all go there. Lots of other people show up, they have a party with lots of alcohol and lots of shenanigans, Nick gets really intoxicated, Myrtle says Daisy's name a couple times, and Tom responds by breaking her nose, and as a queer person, I simply must mention that at the end of this chapter, Nick goes down the elevator with a Mr. McKee described as an effeminate photographer, and then there's a dot 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 followed by, I was standing beside his bed and he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear with a great portfolio in his hands. And then it just cuts to Nick being half asleep at Penn Station. What? Hello? Sir? Nick also always describes the physical forms of the men in, his gr in the book with very great detail as to their size and musculature, and then does not talk about what the women look like really at all, and I just... Nick. My guy. Anyway, so Nick gets a formal invitation to a Gatsby party, and so he goes over to the party, but he doesn't know anybody, and he kind of panics because he can't find Gatsby, and he's alone, and so he just starts drinking because, like, what else are you gonna do? It's a Gatsby party. But then he runs into Jordan, and they get talking, and they hear lots of rumors about Gatsby. There's a drunk guy they call Owl Eyes in the library who's surprised that all the books are real. More rumors happen. They're like, Gatsby killed a man, blah, 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 blah. Then Gatsby shows up, and he's like, oh, Nick, you were in the war. I'd recognize you. I was also in the war. And Nick is like, do you know this Gatsby fellow? I haven't seen him yet. And he's like, oh, oopsies, I am Gatsby. My bad, I'm a terrible host. And then Gatsby takes Jordan aside to talk to her for a bit. Um, and then Gatsby takes Nick to a lunch at a speakeasy the next day and on the way tells Nick the story of how he's a war hero and he went to Oxford and all of these things that feel too suspiciously pre-prepared and scripted, but also Gatsby is so weird at this point that you're like, I mean, it could be a lie, or he could just be a very autistic dude who scripts everything that he says because he struggles with organic speech production, and also that would generally just explain a lot about him, but that's beside the point. We're not talking about autism today. Also, at the speakeasy, we meet Meyer Wolfsheim, who is an anti-Semitic caricature, who's the guy who fixed the World Series, and he has cufflinks made of human molars, which somehow I completely missed the first and second read through this book, and I still don't know how because I feel like that would have stuck in my brain. After this, Nick goes to tea with Jordan at the Plaza Hotel, where Jordan tells Nick that Gatsby and Daisy met each other five years before when he was a lieutenant stationed near her in the war, and they fell head over heels for each other, and it was really cute, but then he was deployed, and Daisy couldn't wait for him, so she married Tom instead. Though, the night before the wedding, Jordan found her intoxicated and crying, clutching a letter, saying that she's changed her mind, a letter she then destroys in the bathtub, and then she marries Tom the next day. Anyway, when Gatsby returned from the war, he found that she'd married Tom, and so he moved to West Egg 
directly across the sound from her house and threw lots of really big parties, hoping that maybe one day she would walk into one of them so they could be reunited and live happily ever after. And the green light is the light at the end of Daisy's dock. And he wants Nick to invite Daisy to a tea at his cottage so then Gatsby can just like happen to stop by and then they'll get reunited and then she'll willingly have an affair with him and then they'll get married. I don't quite know what his logic was, but you know, there's, there's a lot of undertones of like, you know, hope without basis behind it in the American dream and how it's unachievable. Anyway, then the tea happens, the two of them immediately fall for each other and start having an affair. A few months later, she and Tom go to one of Gatsby's parties and Tom figures it out and he gets really angry. And then a few days later, they all go to the plaza again and they get a suite to spend the afternoon and to get there Gatsby and Daisy take Tom's blue car and Tom, Jordan, and Nick take Gatsby's yellow car, which sounds like it doesn't matter, but it does. On the way, Tom and friends stop at George Wilson's for gas, and George is like, I can't get the gas for you over the last few days. I've gotten wised up to something, and I feel really sick. Also, Tom, you said you were going to sell me a car. Do you think you could do that soon? Because I need to have money to take my wife out west immediately. Meanwhile, Myrtle is locked in her bedroom overlooking the car and thinks that Jordan is Tom's wife, and it's just... The whole time. At the plaza, Tom confronts Gatsby about the affair, and Gatsby tells Daisy to tell Tom that she never loved him and they're gonna run off together. And Daisy's like, Yes, I'm leaving you, Tom, but I can't say I never loved you because that would not be true. I loved both of you at the same time. And both of them are very upset by that because toxic masculinity. And then Tom is like, well, I've been doing my research and Gatsby is a filthy bootlegger anyway and I'm going to expose him for it. And then Daisy's like, whoa, oh, hold up. I never thought about that before. I don't know how she didn't think about that before. And also there's the fact that like she and Tom have a child so she gets really overwhelmed and her brain gets all scrambly, reasonably so, especially because this scene is really just two men arguing over the fact that Daisy loves them more without asking for really any input from her, which is just super bizarre and oozes toxic masculinity. And then Tom tells Gatsby to drive Daisy home. They take the yellow car. As they leave, Nick realizes it's his 30th birthday and he fully forgot about it. That's just there. And then the three of them go home in the blue car. On the way home, there's some commotion by Wilson's garage. So they slow down and they find out that Myrtle has been hit by a car and has died. And also the car in question was yellow and it was coming from New York City. Now, George assumes that the person driving the car was the person having the affair with his wife, and then he sees Tom, and he's like, that was your car, you did this, and Tom's like, that wasn't my car, I need you to trust me, I haven't seen it all afternoon. So they go home, everybody's rattled, Nick finds Gatsby waiting outside of the Buchanan's home, and they talk, Gatsby lets it slip that Daisy was driving, not him, but he was gonna take the fall for it because he loves her, but also doesn't think that they were seen, so like, don't worry about it. I'm sorry, they were definitely... Anyway, the next day he decides to swim in his pool because he hasn't used it all summer. And Nick says, sorry, I gotta go to work, but I'll call you later, Gatsby. And Gatsby's like, sounds good, maybe Daisy will call me too, because he's just a very hopeful guy. And then George Wilson goes with a gun to the Buchanan's home, and so Tom tells him that it was Gatsby's car, and then Wilson goes over to Gatsby, and he shoots Gatsby a few times, and then he shoots himself once and then Nick organizes all the funeral stuff but Daisy and Tom left town for a while with no word the day that Gatsby was shot and therefore ignored his calls didn't come to the funeral or they just said they were gone and they weren't that's not super clear and most adaptations they're genuinely gone or actively leaving but it really depends Wolfshine refuses to come to the funeral because he can't get mixed up in it, which gives serious, like, I'm in the mob and used to this energy. That's not explicitly stated, but that's the vibe. And Owl Eyes only calls because he left a pair of tennis shoes that he wants to pick up. The only other person who actually ends up showing up to the funeral genuinely is Gatsby's father. And then Nick has some reflections on the meaning of money and on existence and of life and whatnot and... That's it. That's the book. All kinds of meanings are argued. The general one being about the nature of hope and optimism and the unattainability of the American dream. Think what you want to think. That's not the point of this video. Neither is a discussion of how wildly autistic Gatsby is. That'll find its way into a review somewhere probably in February. The discussion that I will bring up, however, is that Nick is a very unreliable narrator. He constantly talks about how good of a person he is, about how he disapproves of everybody else and their actions while very much participating in them, refers to himself as the only honest person I know, and wholeheartedly defends Gatsby's actions while hating on Tom when at the end of the day they both have affairs and control women and do shady stuff. And then there's also the way that he describes the male characters in comparison to the women, the McKee incident, the fact that he's technically with Jordan the entire book but there's no chemistry between them and he only vaguely mentions her when she's there and nothing further and eventually dumps her. And also Jordan is the most androgynous of the female characters and gives off a lot of lesbian energy. I'm not saying that Nick being an unreliable narrator is him suppressing his sexuality and that part of why he aggressively defends Gatsby's questionable behaviors because he's madly in love with him. But if I were saying that, it would make a lot of Nick's erratic behavior in this book make a lot more sense because 
He spends the book acting like he was a quiet observer who just saw all these things happening and disapproved of them rather than an active participant who helped these things happen. And that level of personal denial definitely carries across. But even if you don't think he's gay, he's a very wildly unreliable narrator regardless. And I think that is part of why the story is so hard to adapt. Because how can you do a good job telling a story if the original storyteller couldn't even do a good job telling the story. So our very first adaptation is the 1926 silent film. It came out in November while the book came out in April of 25. So it was a solid like 18 months after the book was written. Either way, the turnaround time is astounding to me. Like many other silent films, it has been lost um, other than the trailer, which I will link below if you want to check it out. It's really hard to glean any real information from the trailer, so we're not going to go too much into it. Though the Wikipedia page about this film says that Daisy and Tom leave before the murder, so she doesn't know anything about Gatsby's death, and that at some point she tries to publicly confess that she killed Myrtle, which is also definitely interesting. I feel like generally the movie must have been a horrible adaptation because Gatsby as a work is so focused on the language and how things are said which is almost impossible to properly get across in silent film. Um, silent films work the best with stories that lean on visuals and physicality, and this is definitely not the story for that. One thing to mention from the trailer, though, is that they mention that Gatsby is known as being a theater-packing play. The screenplay was based on Owen Davis's stage play, which was on Broadway at the Ambassador Theater from February 2nd to May 1926. If you're wondering, the Ambassador is where Chicago is currently playing. Um, I was not able to get my hands on that adaptation either. It seems like it exists in, a, in like really old book form in select libraries, around the world. I have neither the time, resources, nor really the desire to really track that down. Therefore, our actual first adaptation is in the 1949 film. This one was also largely seen as lost for a while, but then somehow it appeared in full on YouTube at one point for a bit. Every article comparing the four film adaptations watched it via that YouTube upload. YouTube then took it down for copyright. I thought all hope was lost, but I found it on internet archive, so thank you to them. I will link it below for if you want to check it out. This adaptation is hilarious. Not intentionally, it's just so many, like, capital C choices were made, and most of them were questionable. It truly felt as if the addition of Gatsby that they had to work with went through Google Translate like four times and also a blender before they got a chance to look at it. I didn't think about its historical context until after I watched it, so I'll bring you along on this journey with the same mindset I had while watching it and then explain the context afterwards. So this film starts with Nick and his wife, Jordan Baker, at Gatsby's grave. I know, that was a lot of information to begin with. It's a choice. We're not going to go into the period accuracy of the costumes, let's just say it was wild. Um, the following scene is Gatsby buying the mansion, knowing it's next door to Caraway's, yelling about how he needs to redecorate everything, and thinking about getting rid of Caraway. As you will see with other adaptations, Meeting Gatsby early in the piece, before all of the hype gets built up around him, automatically flattens the character a good deal and kind of ruins all of his vibes. Also, where did they get the scene from? Why is it here? Who did this? He also just tells the story of how he went from a poor boy on a yacht to the Gatsby he is today in the first 15 minutes of the film, which is a story you don't normally get until the final, like, quarter of the book because it is a character reveal that is important when it's later because it breaks down the view that you already had of Gatsby. And it's like important that he kept it a secret from a lot of people. But no, he just willingly gives out this information now. A theme throughout this movie is that there are a lot of I guess you could call them plot holes. I think they're very deliberate holes. Um, there are a lot of situations where one character knows one thing and another character knows another thing and their ignorance about the thing the other person knows greatly affects the perceived motivation behind their actions. And throughout this film, they just had every character basically know everything every other character did, which made all of the choices feel more unwise, calculated, and deeply out of pocket than they already do in the original context, or just completely illogical. And it absolutely kills the vibe of every single character on screen being like an airhead with a little bit of malice underneath, but you're not entirely sure. This movie made me realize I might actually like the story because of how mad it was when they kept changing things, but then I embraced the chaos, I giggled the entire time, but also this film really drags. It's it's a very draggy movie. Anyway, some notable moments is that Daisy regularly talks to Jordan about how in love she used to be with a guy named Gatsby, so Jordan puts it together herself and organizes the tea with neither Nick nor Gatsby knowing the tea is happening. Daisy talks about packing her bags when she tells Tom that she's leaving him in the later scene, rather than the anxious like, yes, I, I, I'm leaving you that she barely gets out in the book and in a lot of other adaptations. Gatsby swims in the pool at another time in the film, which makes the significance of it at the end very watered down. Ooh, bad pun. Sorry. We see the car crash and then Daisy straight up says, Tom, I was driving and I hit a woman and then tells him that she will happily leave Gatsby if it means getting out of the troubling fact that she totally just murdered someone. They don't reveal that Myrtle is the lover until way late and any conversations that humanize her as a character are completely cut and Nick and Jordan either have actual chemistry or the chemistry between everybody else is so bad that they're somehow reads the same. 
I'm still not sure what happened there. It's also way more explicit that Gatsby is a bootlegger and Tom actually defends Gatsby saying he won't tell George who owns the car because he won't be responsible for a murder and he tries to call to warn Gatsby but Gatsby misses the call because Nick is yelling at him so Tom calls the police and during the Nick confrontation Gatsby basically says I fired all the servants, I hate money, I'm a dishonest man, I don't want to do this anymore and I'm going to wait for the police to find me or I will call them myself and then Nick watches him get shot. This scene is so wildly funny because Gatsby got shot, fell into the pool, did a remarkably beautiful freestyle front crawl, whatever you want to call it, toward the gunman, which at first I was confused about, but I was like, oh, he must be going toward the ladder. No, he skips the ladder and he pulls himself up out of the pool, away from the ladder, closer to the gunman. What are you doing? And then Wilson shoots him a few more times and then he dramatically falls into the water and holds onto the edge of the pool and then slowly lets go. It's also very unclear whether Wilson actually dies or not. Also, Wolfsheim, the anti-Semitic bootlegger World Series guy, just isn't in this film at all. Gone. Wild from start to finish. This is one of those films where every white guy looks and sounds identical, so you can't actually keep track of any of the characters. Or maybe this isn't a problem other people have and I'm just face blind, because we know that I'm face blind. Anyway, either way, this adaptation felt distinctly incorrect, and I was annoyed at how much they changed from the original book. But I enjoyed it. And then I was reminded that film history exists, and that I've made a video about film history before, Enter the Hayes Code. I will link my video on the Hayes Code above if you're unfamiliar with it, but the super short explanation is that it was a list of censorship rules that all American film scripts had to follow in order to be greenlit for production from 1934 to 1948, though some studios adopted these rules as early as 1924, and they generally existed until the 1960s. These rules included a lot of moral standards, saying that people who do certain things must be punished by the end of the film, a lot of those things being centered around crime and adultery and alcohol consumption and whatnot. So when the initial screenplay was presented to the censors, they were told to rewrite large portions of it, which is how we got the Gatsby grave scene where Nick expresses a lot of moral judgment about the guy that feels really out of character at the beginning. It's why we got the more villainous Gatsby. It's why it's not super clear whether George died or not, because offing oneself could not be shown on screen, and I would assume a lot of the other plot disasters were also a result of this as well. Which does not defend them, it's still a mess of a film, but there is a reason for why things went the way that they did, and the screenwriters were openly very annoyed by the fact because they felt like they were bastardizing Fitzgerald's work on some level. There's something really ironic to me about the blatant censorship of the great American novel, but also that kind of stuff is still happening regularly with famous books in the US to this day, so I shouldn't be surprised. Anyway, next is the 1974 film. Alright, this one was pretty much word for word to the book and it was really 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 boring and it dragged on really long at two hours and 24 minutes of a runtime. It is also one of those films where the dialogue and the music are two completely different volumes so everything's either a mumble or a jump scare. Really enjoyed that. The overall thing that I noticed with this film, this was the first film adaptation I watched, was that it expanded upon the characters you don't hear too much about in the book and fully flattened the ones that you do. Like Daisy has so much more autonomy and depth to the point where you start to understand her point of view on some level. You get a bit more of Jordan and of Wolfsheim and of the other characters but then Gatsby and Nick felt a lot more one-dimensional because they both just look like any other boring guy. But the expansion upon the secondary characters made the love story between Daisy and Gatsby almost work. You actually started to believe it. There aren't many scenes between the two of them after the tea and before the plaza in the book, and this film expanded upon those and added more to make them actually seem like a good couple that you're sort of rooting for rather than a more one-sided creepy situation, because it is really creepy. I also found that I picked up on a lot more things, both with foreshadows and ongoing metaphors, but also the smaller details in watching the movie rather than reading the book. There kept being moments where I'd be like, wait, what? Hello? And then I would go back to the book and realized I did somehow totally miss the fact that Wolfsheim had cufflinks made of actual human molars. Again, you would think a person would remember a thing like that, but I totally missed it. By taking away my need to construct the whole world and cast of characters in my head, I was able to pay better attention to what the actual text was saying. Also, fun fact, the reason that there are so many love scenes between Gatsby and Daisy that are extra is because gay screenwriter Truman Capote wrote the original screenplay for it and fleshed out the fact that Nick was gay and in love with Gatsby. Not by adding in scenes where they, like, partake in gay behavior, but more by leaning into the inflections that already existed within the text. This screenplay was very much rejected, um, and a new one was written, but it's generally assumed that they added more Daisy and Gatsby love scenes in there to really drive home the fact that Gatsby was definitely very straight and Nick was just his friend. Though the Gatsby-Nick relationship, friendship in this film, is very homoerotic. Anywho, this trend of expanding out the love story between Daisy and Gatsby carries over into pretty much every other adaptation after this point, and I very much appreciate that because if you don't believe the love story 
the story does not work. In 1999, there was an opera. I couldn't find a lot of information on this, and frankly, I don't know anything about opera, so my review here, were I to find something, was not going to be helpful anyway. As far as I can tell, there have been either three Gatsby operas or one or two that have had a couple revivals and tours. Unclear! If you know anything about this medium or the Gatsby opera, let me know what you think in the wider scheme of adaptation in the comments. That's all I got for this. Next we have the 2000 made for TV film which was aired on A&E and then the BBC. This was hilarious but more in like the disjointed low budget sort of way than like book accuracy kind of way. Also Nick Carraway is played by a 30 year old Paul Rudd who looks like he's 12. Also they did that historical drama thing from the early 2000s where they have costumes that look like American Eagle decided to do a 1920s inspired line of clothing and then just kept their early 2000s hairstyles because really who's gonna notice and it'll be totally fine. But then their 1917 Gatsby looks like this which is objective not fine and I very much noticed. Now some characters spoke with a semi-period accent and others did not at all which added to the chaos. It was so much fun. But time period travesty aside, it's pretty close to the book and I actually didn't have a lot of notes. They did show Gatsby getting shot during the opening credits which was a fascinating choice. Yet again we did not see any conversation about money or ethics between Myrtle and George which I think is important context for her behavior as a woman in this world. I don't think I mentioned this but the conversation did happen in the 1974 one by the way. They did show the Myrtle murder but not while it was happening. It was more of a flashback when Gatsby was explaining it. They also expanded upon Gatsby's illegal stuff, more about him selling false bonds than the fact that he was a bootlegger. Um, Nick finds the false bonds in this film. It's really weird. I don't know why they added that. But I did find myself really enjoying the ending. So it was chaotic, but not unwelcomely so. I think for accuracy, I still prefer 1974, even though it was a lot more bland and boring than this one. This one's definitely less bland, but it didn't feel like Gatsby. It felt like a high school production of Little Women put on film. It, that makes any sense. Next we have the 2002 rated R film titled G. Um, it's very loosely based on Gatsby and also impossible to track down so that review is not going to be included here. Now we get out of films for a bit. Oh thank goodness. First we have the Simon Levy play which premiered at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis in 2006. My copy of the play that I read was published in 2013. I watched a production of it from 2019 but timeline wise we're gonna put it here. I'm gonna be honest with you I hate this adaptation. It feels like the author or playwright same thing. I feel like the playwright did not trust the actors to do any research into the characters at all beforehand or have any acting skill, nor did he trust the audience to be capable of drawing their own conclusions about anything. And so he just put all of their personalities really explicitly, aggressively into the text to the point where you feel like it is being shoved down your throat. Which for the book, where so much of it is unsure and dreamlike and weird and messy and confusing and debatable, a heavy-handed, super explicit method of storytelling does not work. It tells the basic story, sure, but it flattens most of the point of why the story exists by cutting out all possibility for personal interpretation. Things that I found interesting with this adaptation, however, is that it opened with a roaring party followed by Nick standing and giving the opening monologue while behind him Gatsby is standing with his back to the audience, studying the green light, and then exiting without being able to see his face. This story framing will come up once or twice in further adaptations. This is the first place I saw it. I love it. It's so cool. You get a sense of Gatsby without getting a sense of Gatsby and it adds like a level of mystery of who is this guy. There was also a scene where Daisy is watching the party across the bay and saying that she and Tom ought to go sometime but he refuses which added strength to why he generally kind of sucks as a guy. I also love the added moment at the party between Nick and Gatsby where they reference their time in the war and mention that their lives will never be the same because of it and the people around them will never truly understand what it's like to be in the trenches. We'll see a handful of period accurate mentions of PTSD throughout the following adaptations but I think as a concept. It adds so much more to these characters, particularly in looking at Gatsby as a guy who went through the terror of war, clinging onto his hope of one day marrying his sweetheart at home to help him get through, only to come home and find that she's already married to somebody else and that hope is lost. It makes his like objectively bad coping mechanism make a lot more sense and feel significantly less creepy. They added that Jordan knew what was in the letter from Gatsby that Daisy destroyed in the bathtub the evening before her wedding, which was weird because I've never seen that before. They just came up with that. It was also weird that the conversation between Daisy and Gatsby at tea is explicitly spelled out in the script because in every other adaptation and in the original, we don't know what they said to each other. We just know that like the conversation happened and they started having an affair afterwards. They had Jordan at the lunch in the speakeasy with Gatsby and Nick and Wolfsheim, which I guess was to smoothly move from the lunch conversation to Jordan telling Nick about the Daisy situation, but also Jordan would never find herself in a speakeasy, so why why is she there? Her overlapping with Wolfsheim was just really weird and makes no sense. They showed Gatsby is a crook by basically just having Wolfsheim stand around and be like, Jay, you have things to do, rather than like, 
a smattering of vague phone calls that he has throughout pretty much every other adaptation up until this point. There was also a line where Gatsby says he saved his money and Nick goes, I thought you inherited your money. And then Gatsby's like, ah, oh, yes, I inherited it, but I lost it in the war. It's in everything, but here they cut the I lost it in a war bit, which just made him seem more sketchy and weird. I personally prefer the adaptations where you are on the same wavelength as Nick throughout, thinking that he is a cool guy to like emulate. And then in the final third, that's starting to unravel that he's doing illegal things rather than having that heavy handed throughout the entire thing. The love between Daisy and Gatsby is also very explicit with her telling him she's always loved him and actively waited for him and also her on a whim telling Nick that she's decided she's going to leave Tom, which doesn't really make sense given that in the plaza scene she's still unsure and overwhelmed. So her being super sure about this earlier with neither Tom nor Gatsby around feels very weird, especially because at one point she packs her suitcases and brings them to Gatsby saying she's ready to run away with him now. And he's like, no, I'm not leaving. Also, where did that come from? And then Jordan tells Nick that Gatsby wants Daisy to say she never loved Tom to his face, which feels really weird and premeditated if all of them know about that before it happens and it's not like a spur of the moment thing. And also there's an active physical fight between Tom and Gatsby at the plaza, which was very bizarre. And the one thing that really did bother me, there was one point where Nick yells at Jordan for having cheated in a golf game and she responds telling them that he's one of the few honest people she knows, which is an important line, but only when Nick says it about himself because it proves that he is an unreliable narrator. So Jordan saying it just feels like we're cementing this good guy Nick narrative that's everywhere. And then the end of the play just felt really rushed. The general pacing was pretty wonky. I think watching the play live is very different from watching a play on YouTube because a lot of things in theater feel way more natural and normal and human when you are in a space in person rather than watching through a screen. And that intimacy is part of why many things work on stage that don't work on film. For example, Dear Evan Hansen. But generally this adaptation felt to me generally no different from the films without the ability to easily cut from scene to scene that films have and no fluid motion throughout it that made it easier for the actors and script to cut from scene to scene. So I ended up just feeling really disjointed. Next we have the ballets. The first one I found was in 2009, but this is the same situation as the operas here. I don't know a lot about this medium, so there are either several ballets or there's only one or two that show up in lots of different places. I don't know how that works. Um, I did watch some clips from the Northern Ballet production a few months ago and was genuinely surprised at how well things seem to work because like, as I said with the silent film situation, the medium of ballet is not having words and Gatsby is a very words oriented story. Most of the important pieces of it are very rooted in wordplay and linguistic metaphor. So a telling of a story without words, even though dance and music can capture emotions and experiences often with similar, if not more depth to words alone, still made me feel like it's gonna be lacking in storytelling. We're gonna miss a lot of stuff. But what I saw from the Northern Ballet clips was like an emphasis on specific props as visual metaphors to carry things across and the way the dancers interacted with each other and those props said a lot about their relationships. So while I do think some elements of the story would be missed in this format, I think it definitely works way more than I initially thought that it would. But again, if you know more about this medium and or specific Gatsby ballets, please include your thoughts in the comments. I would love to hear them. After this, we have Gats, a 2010 play by Elevator Repair Service that they describe as being eight hours long and with a cast of 13. Gats is by far ERS's most ambitious endeavor yet. Not a retelling of the Gatsby story, but an enactment of the novel itself. Fitzgerald's American masterpiece is delivered word for word, startlingly brought to life by a low-rent office staff in the midst of their inscrutable business operations. The eight hours accounts for six hours of performances with a dinner break and two intermissions. That's terrifying to me. I did watch some clips and basically it seems like the guy playing Nick holds the book through the entire play and reads directly from it and the other characters chime in with their lines where applicable. All of the reviews I read of it were basically like, this is cool and good and wow, and I loved it. I did not feel particularly inclined toward the clips that I saw, nor riveted by the concept of an eight hour show. I think it's an interesting idea, but having one actor with his nose in a book the entire time makes it feel very distanced from the audience. And I feel like the positives of, oh, we have the entire text in our play and also you get to see it is kind of outweighed by its length and general lack of riveting performance. Like it's fine, but it's not enough to justify that much time spent when you can get the same story presented fairly accurately in the three very boring hours of the 1979 film or the five and a half hours that are the audiobook. I could be entirely wrong on this. That's totally reasonable. I did not experience it, but I think in regards to types of adaptations, I do not see what this one adds to the adaptation canon for this work that is like extra other than like, oh, they have the whole book and you can see some of it 
Yay. Next we have the 2012 BBC radio play. I was very surprised that I loved this as much as I did. If you have a particular craving for Gatsby after this video, this is the only one of my top three favorites that is available for free, and it is also the shortest. So you should check it out. I will link it below. They did a lot of scrambling in this adaptation in the sense of shifting around tiny throwaway lines or adding things, but they consistently did it in a way that actually expanded upon the characters or showed specific traits of theirs that through a primarily dialogue-based medium with no associated visuals are very hard to tell or notice. It didn't feel like they were reading a play and we were missing the visuals. It felt more like I was sitting by an old-timey radio set listening to a broadcast before in-home televisions were a thing, if that makes sense. There was also one line that Tom said toward Jordan that I don't specifically remember what it was, but it totally made it sound like he was also having an affair with Jordan at the same time, or at least had tried to have one with her, which is such an interesting choice that I kind of loved. They did add way more racism and anti-Semitism into the script. The racism anti-semitism in the original book is pretty strong but they decided to add more here for some reason I don't know why they did that that's the only thing I really didn't like um, obviously racism existed in this time period we will see down the line that most adaptations that cut the racism actually made things worse by doing so but there was way too much added in here and I don't understand why they also added in the PTSD elements again which I really loved my favorite part of this adaptation is that um, there's a section where Nick is talking to Gatsby's grave and talks about all of the times they had together and how he learned how Gatsby became Gatsby and it's all really sweet and feels very non-platonic and cute and adorable and it really made me see their friendship with a depth that I haven't seen much before because Nick is typically just used as a bland, flat character that exists. Um, also, the voiceover idea works really well in this format without feeling super out of place or somewhat rushed because it's a film and they don't have enough like B-roll to put underneath it or a play where they don't have anything happening on stage and they don't want to have a monologue going on for too long. Then we have one of my other favorite adaptations, which is the 2013 Baz Luhrmann film. I know that there are a lot of arguments as to whether this is actually a good film or good adaptation or not. I loved it. This Nick has some sort of dark edge to him. He's not entirely confused overwhelmed childlike that we've seen in other adaptations thus far, which helps frame this narrative as not totally being what he says it is, which is helped by the opening scene of the film being Nick in a psychiatric hospital explaining this whole story to a doctor. By getting the visual of this broken down Nick followed by the bright brand new Nick from a year before back to back, we see the hope like drain out of him as he becomes disillusioned and see how these events actually did genuinely affect him and how he affected the events. They also squarely put that narrative back into Nick's hands in a very clear way with the rest of the film being him telling this story the way he experienced it, which is a great way to sort of get around the unreal reliable narrator situation. The other thing that I loved about this film is that they didn't try to be old-timey. They melded the current popular media trends and filmmaking styles and music with the period accurate costumes and phrasing which made it sparkle and move in a way that none of the other adaptations have thus far. Somehow by making it less in that time period they made it feel more in that time period and you felt more connected to it which is just genius all around. Now one note I did write down is lovingly what the actual f*** is DiCaprio's accent. It sounds like he's saying molt spore when he says old sport but other Otherwise, it was great. They also expanded upon the love between Daisy and Gatsby even more than the other versions, which helped the romance feel more real and the stakes feel a lot higher. In the plaza scene, Gatsby almost punches Tom, which helps you realize that Gatsby isn't really that great either, and you understand Daisy's hesitancy and panic a little bit more because of that. It also directly showed Myrtle getting hit, which was an interesting choice, and they didn't have the argument between Myrtle and George about the money and why she wants to leave him, but they did argue a little bit about where she got her fancy pearls from, so it's like halfway there, but I wish they'd flesh that out a little bit more because it's a really interesting interesting look into feminism and like what women had to do to gain power. Because the thing about Myrtle is that she was expecting to marry well. George told her he was on the brink of making it big. She trusted him on that and married him because women needed to marry to have status, only to learn that he'd fully lied and she has no way out because she's a woman in the 1920s. And I feel like that is not talked about enough in these adaptations and it's easier to just paint her as like the villainous mistress and not like somebody who is complicated. After Gatsby dies, it made it super explicit that the papers basically just picked up that Gatsby was a bootlegger mobster kind of guy who was Myrtle's lover and then killed her in cold blood and Nick couldn't do anything to stop that narrative. This came up in other versions more vaguely, but I like how explicitly it played out in this one. Also, the racist lines were kept in the film, but at the same time, we got to see elements of the Harlem Renaissance and of Black Wall Street, which was really, really cool and showed a further level of their detachment from the wider world around them. But I really like this adaptation. Going into this, I assumed that film would be the best way to adapt the story because 
because you get to see all the characters physically fleshed out and you can easily cut from scene to scene and that's expected in this medium, kind of like creating the ability for the non sequiturs in the books to actually work and for a disjointed flow to be effective. I didn't think about the existence of radio plays when I started this. I actually now think that radio plays might be more effective of an adaptation for this because it can be more word heavy and you can imagine what the characters look like without the whole this actor doesn't look like what I thought that character looked like situation that happens a lot with film. But also we have five more adaptations to go. We're not done yet. So next we have the 2021 graphic novel by Kay Woodman Maynard. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, there's a more recent one I believe but this one had the first 50 pages in a pdf for free online and I'm not buying a Gatsby graphic novel for this so I went with that one. It's basically an abridged version of the text with illustrations behind it. I really liked how they gave you the character vibes via the kind of text bubbles they use. Like Daisy had a very wispy text bubble while Tom's were more solid and firm and like square. I love the connections between the text and the imagery of the text as well. I think it visualizes the text in a cool way. But the way that it was done here was really hard to read like with the font they used and you couldn't always tell if you had read all the words on the page because some of them were somewhat hidden. I feel like this type of text would be best used for disabled folks to make some of the more obscure elements of the text clearer, to break it into more bite-sized pieces and make themes more obvious, but then it's an abridged version of the text so it can't actually be used as a substitute text in a classroom setting. And having some parts of this changed, condensed, and or cut made it slightly hard to follow at times, and there's just something off-putting to me about an adaptation that requires you to read the original first in order to understand what's going on. Because that just What's the point? I'm not opposed to this concept. I think as a classroom access tool more than anything, it would be really, really cool. But the execution here was definitely not my vibe. Then we have the 2021 play by Pioneer Drama, also a free PDF online. This one is sort of similar to the 2006 play, but also the BBC radio play as well. It feels like somebody just kind of smushed the two of those together. There's a lot of Nick asides throughout that were voiceovers while action was happening on stage, which felt odd and disconnected from the action on stage. There was also a whole dialogue moment at the end where Gatsby is like, Daisy and I were from two different worlds so it would never work. I was looking after the memory of a dream and I plan to never contact Daisy again because I think that's what's best for her. Which I feel like defeats the purpose of how at the end Gatsby remains forever hopeful to an almost delusional point where he can't see the reality of the world around him but you also are somewhat comforted that he died with the dream held in his heart. So that whole little monologue thing felt super wildly out of character for him. They also took out all of the racism and anti-semitism from the script which like fine racism and anti-semitism are bad but the thing that I found through adaptations and comments on adaptations is that in taking out the explicit mentions of racist and anti-Semitic things in the dialogue, you start to see Wolfsheim as being a reasonable character rather than a grossly anti-Semitic caricature because there's nothing in the text to make you pause and go, huh, some of this is outdated. Let me think more critically about the things that are going on on the stage and the characters and the storytelling, which gets dangerous quickly. Anyway, almost done. Now we have the 2023 radio play. This one seemed to be adapted from the 2013 film and not the book. Um, the production value of the version I listened to was pretty not great. They clearly had very limited, if any, rehearsal time. So I don't want to judge it too harshly. It was like a community theater thing. Um, but I will say that Daisy and Gatsby had no chemistry and also really did not have any time spent together to build up a believable romance. So there were literally no stakes. So what was the point? Also, they took out all the racism, which again, as mentioned earlier, isn't the greatest choice if you're not going to do anything about Wolfsheim to try to offset that situation. Next we have the Immersive Gatsby, which was created in York in 2015 and then opened in London for a bit in 2019, running until January of 2023. It also opened at the Park Central Hotel in New York City from June 25th to August 27th. That was the week I moved here, so I did not get the chance to go. Based on the reviews I read and watched of both the New York and London productions, this concept seems to sort of kind of work. Basically, you get all dressed up, you go to one of Gatsby's parties, you get to party along with people on the dance floor, which is where most of the action happens, but then you occasionally get pulled into smaller rooms to learn various side plot pieces. So basically you go in expecting a party and then you get to be a part of all of the social drama. And the biggest thing that I found in most of the reviews is it's fun, but also if you don't know the plot of the book, you're pretty screwed for the entire thing. In general, the only time I've seen immersive theater work was with Here Lies Love, and I've heard that Sleep No More is incredible as well, um, but I've heard from other people that it doesn't work. I generally find immersive theater to be a very flimsy storytelling method because some people come for the show and don't immerse themselves in it because they want to pay attention. Others immerse too much and miss the actual show, and the plot is rarely clear cut enough because you have to split it up to be easy to follow along while also experiencing the thing at the same time. So conceptually, this is a really cool idea, but as an adaptation medium, 
especially for a story very convoluted and metaphorical and whatnot as Gatsby, I think it risks teetering entirely into like, OMG, Gatsby 1920s party, and shortchanging the theatrical aspects of it, which therefore shortchanges the story, which is what a lot of the reviews seem to say. But if you've gone to this, you've seen it, and you have other opinions, please let me know. I would love to know your thoughts and opinions. The New York one did announce when they were closing that they were potentially moving venues, so who knows? Maybe it'll pop up again, and maybe I'll check it out. Or maybe I'm really tired of Gatsby. I think I'm really tired of Gatsby. For a final adaptation, we have the musical at Paper Mill Playhouse. I'm not gonna lie, I heard the show was meh, I knew the track record that Gatsby adaptations have of making the story either really bland or really wrong, and I knew that the runtime of the show, including intermission, was 2 hours and 45 minutes, which gave me flashbacks to the 1970s film, and I knew that I would have to take an hour-long train to New Jersey to see this thing, so my expectations were on the floor. So when I say that this was hands down my favorite adaptation of them all, and probably one of my favorite musicals of the season, believe me, I'm just as surprised as you are. Also, I made an access review for this show. I will link it below, but it was pretty excessively staged as well, which for a modern show about the Roaring Twenties, I expected a lot of flashing lights going on, and they simply didn't really have that, which brought me so much joy. It opened a lot like the plays, with Gatsby standing with his back to the audience, looking at the green light, which I just love the imagery of, but then Gatsby turned around and started singing the opening number, which was fun, but it did break literally all of the mystery and intrigue behind the guy, because he's opening the show by himself. And then there was like a big reveal of him later in the show, a few numbers down the line, which felt pointless because we'd already seen him before. So why is it? Anyway, the show is generally pretty stepwise with the plot, so I'll just go through my notes more based on like themes than anything. In regards to Nick being gay, they did have McKee be very, very, very flirty and fall asleep on his lap during the Myrtle party scene. Also, he had a line earlier in the show saying that he had been staying at the YMCA for a while, which is known historically as being a very, very gay place. That's kind of as far as they went with it. I think they could have gone a little bit more. Nick, at the beginning, is generally very, very clueless as to what's going on, and he generally, like, sticks to his morals of what he thinks is right. But then over time, as there becomes less of a clear right and wrong, he just kind of goes with the flow of what he thinks is happening. But the way that it's staged and written, it's very clear that he has a whole lot of autonomy and agency over what is happening, what's going on, and is actively causing a lot of these events to happen despite claiming to disapprove of them, which is as close to unreliable Nick as I have seen thus far. In regards to racism and the Wolfsheim situation, they cut the racist lines if I remember correctly, but also their friend group isn't entirely white in this version, so that actually makes sense. Um, and Wolfsheim is expanded upon a lot more as a character, being the guy who spends most of his time at Gatsby's home, directing Gatsby's actions, controlling the import of black market goods. He's got a whole song, so overall it wasn't perfect, the character is still a crook with the name Wolfsheim, but it's a whole lot better than what I've seen before. They also expanded upon George Wilson a good deal, with him having a song and like feeling feelings and wanting to do better by his wife, which results in him using his garage as a drop-off and pickup point for Wolfsheim's bootlegged alcohol and drugs, which in theory would disseminate into Gatsby, but for a while there you're not quite sure. You're like, oh, maybe Wolfsheim is doing creepy stuff on the side. Maybe Gatsby is a normal guy who accidentally got caught up in a mess and didn't realize it, which makes him feel a lot less creepy and controlling and a lot more just like a hopeless romantic who's just trying his best, so you believe that romance a whole lot more. And then, during the funeral sequence, when Wolfsheim tells Nick that Gatsby was a remarkable con artist and bootlegger, and was in fact so focused on getting to Daisy that he orchestrated the cheap cottage rent and information about it to be sent to Nick so that he could move there, so he could use Nick to get Daisy, that felt a little too strongly manipulative, even for Gatsby, but it did make that realization hit you like a ton of bricks in a way that I do feel like it should, in that like, yeah, Gatsby's been lying a lot this entire time, because you believe in this guy for so long and you trust him in the way that Nick does, but then you see him slowly descend into his own like, unrealistic and selfish fantasy that hurts everyone around him, but he's unable to see that because he's too focused on a dream that he's already lost. They also expanded upon how he put away his illegal work once his affair with Daisy began, and how that negatively impacted Wolfsheim and therefore George Wilson, and how his choices were causing active harm, which felt like part of why he has no friends at the funeral at the end. Also, they added in a mention of the way war changes a person and affects behavior early in the show, which brought me joy. I love this PTSD through line that we have going on. The way that they handled the women was also very cool, more explicitly explaining what marriage means to them within the historical context, and how they have a lack of agency where their husbands can cheat on them with no consequence, but if they cheat on their husbands, they risk losing everything. They also explained the monetary and political situations of the time really well, but in a natural way that helped give context for you to understand the plot and weight of things better. Um, the famous line where Daisy says she wishes her daughter were a beautiful little fool is moved to the end, after Gatsby's death, and when everything is terrible, and it packs like 
like an absolute punch, oh my gosh. Because you realize it's better to be a fool who doesn't think about choices than to want to make them but to be unable to, which I just thought was genius and it's such a great use of that phrase. Also, Daisy's first song was really wordy with minimal meaning, which showed her personality so well. Myrtle had a song about how she married George thinking he would strike it rich but discovered he'd worn a secondhand suit to the wedding. Um, she also has a song later where she realizes that she's pregnant with Tom's child and walks down the highway to try to get to the plaza and that's when she gets hit. And she tries to tell George that she did it for him, she had the affair, so they could get a payoff from the rich man who is the father and live comfortably together forever. Um, from a motivation perspective, Myrtle's motivation is already really strong without the pregnancy. I get why they added it in there to try to raise the stakes a little bit more, but it kind of removes the like, she ran out into the street because she thought Tom was coming back for her in that car motivation. I loved the song. I do love that she is trying to go after him. I just felt like maybe she could do that while locked in her bedroom, trying to decide what to do, and then she breaks free and runs out after him and gets hit. Because so much of the show is so close to the book and this bit felt really out of left field for me. The romance between Jordan and Nick actually worked somehow? What? Um, with her being the proverbial pants in the relationship and agreeing to marriage, but then looking at Tom and Daisy's marriage and thinking maybe she'd rather never marry, and it gives her a lot more agency as well, which is really cool. She's also at the tea with Daisy and Gatsby, but that really worked well and I liked it a lot because you got to see the juxtaposition of the two couples. They had Gatsby directly tell Nick that he wanted him to hold the tea, not go through Jordan, but it made a nice dichotomy between Daisy asking Jordan about Gatsby and Gatsby asking Nick about Daisy, which I really liked seeing that in both directions. Also, the Daisy got drunk before the wedding after getting a letter from Gatsby thing didn't happen. They instead say that her father hid all of his letters to her, so she assumed that he had died in the war, which changes her motivation a little bit, but I think I liked it. Also, we got the scene that is in one of the play, I think the first play, a lot of this was very similar to the first play, but a lot less heavy handed about it, um, where she stands watching the party and wants to go at some point, but Tom says no. They also added in the fact that there was a song that Gatsby and Daisy danced to at the officer's ball all those years ago that Gatsby plays at midnight during every party, which she hears across the sound, which was just heartbreakingly adorable. Um, and also the party of his that Daisy and Tom end up going to is themed like that officer's ball with everybody in their military uniforms, except for Tom, who didn't fight in the war because he paid off some people so he didn't have to serve. So he was the only man in plain clothes in comparison to everybody else, which made him look extra out of place, which was just, oh, it was so well done. The romance was just perfect. I loved it so much. Incredible work all around. Also, frankly, Okay, when when this show gets to Broadway or opens somewhere else, it should come back. It probably will come back, statistically. Um, the song Green Light that they sing right before intermission is worth the price of the ticket. Like, I cannot express... I'm like tearing up thinking about the song. It, I, I, let's go see this. Anyway, okay, after the Myrtle situation, Tom straight up tells Wilson that it was Gatsby's car and where Gatsby lives. Wilson is extra distraught because the police find the crates of illegal things at his gas station. So there's like the double motivation for the murder situation going on. And then after the death, Nick and Daisy have a conversation, which is where the beautiful fool song happened. I loved having that extra depth there. It was so good. And then my absolute favorite part of the whole thing, right before the finale number, which was a circular ending with the song, um, and then Gatsby standing and looking at the green light, mind you, I love circular endings. But Nick did the famous opening, in my younger and more vulnerable years piece of the text, followed, which is the first paragraph of the book, followed by the last paragraph of the book about how Gatsby believed in the green light and how we beat on boats against the current born back ceaselessly into the past, which was genius and perfect and gorgeous and I am still obsessing over it. Beautiful textual craftsmanship and storytelling on their part to to move things around that, oh, it was so good. I think why this show works so well in comparison to the plays in particular is because it takes a lot of time to make a musical. And it also takes a really large team to make a musical, which gives the time to really understand every character and nuance and think through your story from a bunch of different angles. And adding a song into a story, not in the sense of sound design, but in the sense of like actual narrative songs, requires you to understand it to an even finer degree because you have to figure out what emotions need to be captured, why something would work better as a dialogue or as a song, what that pacing would look like and how everything ties together. It also goes through a preview period, meaning that the creative team gets to see it a lot and make changes to it with the actors rather than say an editing room where you could, I guess, grab actors to reshoot something that it's really difficult to do. I often find that musical forms of things are better than their film or book counterpoints because of how they expand upon characters, storylines, and emotions 
with the exception of Back to the Future, um, and the intimate experience of being in a theater with other people and with the performers and seeing that story play out in front of you in real time brings it all together in a very unique way that many other mediums do not have the ability to do. Now if I could change anything about this adaptation, I would definitely change the Myrtle subplot uh, back to be closer to the book. I would take Gatsby out of the first number, and I would either have them all go to the plaza on a different day and state that, or have them not change costumes for that scene because that was really weird. I was really confused. And also I think Wolfsheim needs a little bit more work. And also they were placed with the I just realized today's my birthday line with Jordan and I are engaged, which felt really weird because they had pretty much every other famous line from the book in the show except that one, which is a very specific moment when it happens too. And it was really weird to not have that there. But otherwise, I thought it was incredible and I request a cast recording immediately. But that is my last adaptation. There will be more. I'm sure there are more I missed in my research. I know an animated feature written by by Brian Selznick is in the works. I'm so excited about that. Um, there's also the ART Gatsby show. I'm sure another thing will have been published between the time I wrote this and the time you're seeing it, but there you go. I think in conclusion, the conclusion I came to at the end of all of this is that we expect different things from different mediums of consuming art. And each medium inherently pulls out different elements of a story. Like in a book, we get the inner minds of the characters that we can't get on screen, but on screen we get to see the actions in a way we cannot imagine when we read the book. Meanwhile, we expect a play or musical to feel more intimate because we are in the space with it, but that also requires more suspension of imagination because some things you just can't quite get done on a stage properly. And with a play, we expect it to be more world focused, while a musical is more feeling and vibe focused. None of these things are inherently better or worse than each other, but they're all different and they all tell stories differently. And sometimes the medium you least expect to work for a story is actually the one that you end up loving the most because it wasn't intuitive and required a lot of extra time and care and thought, which is why I think the ballets and operas also probably work really well. And then there's also the innovation of bringing the expectations of one medium into another that just adds extra layers to it. In my perfect Gatsby adaptation, I think I would choose to keep it as a musical very similar to the paper mill one because it helps romance up the story in a way that other mediums didn't really possess, but it would definitely pay more attention to the PTSD and the coping aspects of Gatsby's motivation and would figure out some way to make it clear that Nick is a ridiculously unreliable narrator. Also bring back the McKee scene because it isn't in any adaptations and that's frankly cowardly. Bring it back. And I also kind of want to combine Wolfsheim with some other minor character or something to try to reframe him a little bit because he's a mess. And I want him to have more motivation and drive like we saw with George in the show because humanizing villains and villain adjacent folks is one of my favorite things to do. But also, please don't give me a chance to make an adaptation of the show because I never want to hear the word Gatsby again. Unless the paper mill show ends up somewhere in which I'm seeing it like 13 times. I think I'm gonna wrap this one up here. I would love to know your thoughts on the nature of adaptation in the comments, what kinds of things you've noticed between adaptations or between works for Gatsby or other things, um, how you think someone could adapt a story with an unreliable narrator for any form of media, what your dream Gatsby adaptation would be, anything else that brings you joy, I'd love to hear what y'all think. Uh, yeah, that's it. As always, thank you for listening, thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.